Hi, everyone. I'm Brian Love, head of banking and fintech at the Trevelyan Group. I'm joined today by Scott Hildenbrand, who is the managing director and chief balance sheet strategist and head of the financial strategies group at Piper Sandler. Um, welcome, Scott. How are you? How are you? Thanks for having me today. I'm excited to uh, have a little conversation with you. Yeah, you bet. And the reason I decided to reach out to you is that um, heading into 2022 seemed like, you know, everything was kind of coasting in a positive way for banks. And more recently, right here at kind of the tail end of Q Q1, we noticed that, you know, with the Ukrainian situation and, and uh, some other things happening in our economy, um, you know, things are a little bit different now. And our community bank clients might want to think a little bit more about their balance sheet strategy. And so your, your name is obviously one that comes up in my mind is, it's what you do, right? So tell us a little bit about what you do. And then maybe, you know, help me understand how, uh, how banks should be using their balance sheet as a weapon, as you put it. Sure. No, and again, thanks for having me, but I'll keep it quick. But uh, I spend pretty much every day, all day myself and have a team of 26 of us who spend all day, every day working with community banks, thrifts, uh, credit unions, all dealing with changes in interest rate, changes in asset and liability mix, and how to really put together a game plan for where we're headed from an interest rate risk and balance sheet strategy perspective. Um, and it all kind of starts with asset liability modeling. You know, if you can't, if you can't kind of determine what we look like, uh, it's going to be really difficult to determine strategies going forward. So it's kind of start backwards by understanding where we are and then thinking about what potentially could happen and what we're going to do if that does happen. And I think that's the key as well. As you, as you alluded to, things are a little bit different than planned already in 22. Yeah. And so that, that comment about using your balance sheet as a weapon, thinking a little bit creatively around, um, you know, uh, what's going on. Um, tell me what is your, you know, kind of primary message yeah. to yeah. community banks out there? No, it's, um, and, and, you know, I, I'm allowed to say this, and I mean this nicely, you know, I, I, I travel the country, I'm probably in more board and ALCO rooms, maybe than anybody. And I'll tell you, there's two types of ALCOs and balance sheet strategists in the world, right, in the, in the community bank sports space. You've got sort of the 80% of the world that treats ALCO like a dentist appointment, um, truly can't wait to get out of there, make sure the examiners are happy and we move on. You've got the other 20% who actually play a little bit offense and they look at their balance sheet as a weapon in terms of what can I offer my customers in terms of term, rate, product, optionality that maybe some of my competitors can't. And I can't do that, Brian, without truly understanding what my balance sheet looks like, what part of the yield curve I'm even exposed to, right? So that maybe I can differentiate my earning assets and the way that I'm driving loan growth and serving my customers in my area, um, in my community better um, and doing it by, by using that balance sheet as a weapon. And you, you spoke, when we were talking before, you mentioned that banks shouldn't confuse their interest rate risk with yield curve risk. And that is a huge point for you. Nice. So tell me more about that thought process. Sure. Yeah, no, when I, when I grew up in the, and you and I are around the same age, we kind of started uh, you remember your early days as well. When we thought about interest rate risk, all we really thought about was taking interest rates on a parallel shift, up 100, up 200, down 100, down 200. And that's kind of how I, I, I learned the business. But as I've gone and I learned a lot over the last couple of years, given all the rate moves and everything that's gone on with the Fed, is that the first question I ask every board and ALCO room, and I don't get great answers all the time, Brian, is what part of the yield curve matters most to you? Everybody kind of gives me a weird look. Um, because what I found is about 80% of spread business is driven off about 20% of the yield curve. So at times, I think we get a little bit too comfortable saying, I do well when rates rise. I don't do well when rates rise. The old asset or liability sensitive approach, which worked when I first started. Um, but today, you got to understand the parts of the curve that matter most to you. And then from there, determine strategies um, to either take advantage of opportunities or address concerns depending on those rate shifts, right? You go back just a year ago, Brian, and you think about March of 21, we saw a 10-year treasury double. And every yeah. investor in bank stocks I, spoke, I speak to, they kind of called me and said, hey, Scott, everybody told me they do better when rates rise. The 10 years doubled and everybody's running for the hills when they want to talk about margin projections. And it's because nobody's really exposed to the 10-year part of the curve, right? It's mm -hmm. not, not organically maybe synthetically, and that's when you start to use your web balance sheet as a weapon. Um, but, but I learned it from there. And then if you think about where we are today, twos and tens used to have a wide spread a year ago. 
that's that's cut in half. And what has been wider is the Fed funds and five year spread. And that really drives a lot of community bank margins. And that's where you have to design your strategy once you determine the parts of the curve that matter most to you. Yeah, and it's kind of this strange dichotomy because um, a, a well-run franchise is usually measured by its deposit generation. Mm -hmm. However, every, everyone's flush with deposits and they're kind of burning a hole into balance sheets. Right. So, you know, what are you noticing on how to deploy these best, you know, out in, in, the, in with lending um, or even maybe acquiring loan pools? Yeah, no, it, it has really been an interesting to watch through this entire deposit mania, right? You go back to January of 20. Could you imagine if I stood up at a, at a conference and I'm speaking and I said, I know you all are fighting each other for the next deposit to come in. Give me two months and I'm going to give you more deposits more non-interest bearing deposits than you've ever seen in your entire career times 10. Everybody look at me like I was crazy, right? Two months later, boom, that's exactly what's happened. Yeah. Yeah. And so we went from fight, I think people forget, right? Because so much has happened in a short period of time. But I'll tell you what, 2019, 2018, those were very difficult deposit gathering times. And you flip it on its head, it didn't take more than a month for that to dramatically shift. And so naturally it caught pretty much everyone off guard. There's no, there's no playbook for the 100 basis point rate cut on a Sunday with $6 trillion dumped into the industry. There isn't. So yeah. how, do you, how do you think about and, and, and model and project not only what your deposits are gonna look like, but now you've got pressure on the asset side, right? And so not only did all of that happen, I couldn't find a loan anywhere, right? Because the economy was literally told to stop. And then the other asset class typically banks spend their time on are securities in the investment portfolio. And guess who's buying those? The Fed. And they're buying them yeah. at bigger sizes. So all of a sudden we saw spreads tightening, yields at all-time lows. And I had to go buy assets, sit in cash, or try to originate a loan wherever I could find it. All three were very difficult choices. But I'll tell you, um, I, I think as we've gone, you know, the first three to six months when COVID started, everybody told me deposits would start running out the, out the bank. Then it was about a year. Now we're full two years in, and I'm still looking at low loan to deposit ratios across this country. And when I get asked the question, I get the asked the question a lot. Um, and I apologize if I'm skipping ahead, but the Fed's going to move rates here on Wednesday, right? I think it's Wednesday this week. And you know, everybody's kind of like, well, what's going to happen to cost of funds? What's going to happen to deposits? And my my answer is probably nothing, right? Because what I what I always modeled back when I first started 20 years ago is I always kind of tied my cost of funds and my offering rates on the deposit side to what the Fed did, some percentage of yeah. that, to call it a beta. Today's that's different. That's different. I look at me and my top 10 competitors loan to deposit ratio. That will be my trigger of when and if I have to start increasing my, my deposit rate. So I think the world has changed. We can't model and project the same way we did before. It'll happen. The pendulum will swing. But I think you got to be putting assets on whether it's loan origination, which is the first place, right? Mm -hmm. Number two is obviously the securities world. You got to hold your nose. Sitting there waiting in cash and trying to hit the home run is frightening to me as well. And everybody tells me that's conservative. That's a bet. Um, and then the third one, and you mentioned it, and you're right, looking at different loan packages across the country at other institutions, that's very difficult because nobody wants to be a seller. And I got a thousand buyers, right, of, 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 of the paper. And, that, and that's a challenge. That's a challenge as well, which drives spreads down dramatically too. So it is, it is not easy right now to be a bank CFO, managing changes in rates, balance sheet changes, the board, stock price, the markets, inflation. I mean, it's a lot going on, um, as you can imagine. So it's been keeping us certainly very busy uh, over here at Piper Sandler. Well, and that's an interesting point. And from the talent perspective, as that's my purview, yep. you know, there's kind of an evolution in the CFO seat to some degree. Um, and there's, I mean, there's tremendously talented CFOs there. I'm not trying to, uh, you know, poke at anyone, um, but there may be an evolution of the skill sets um, and the different things, you know, gone are the days of a bean counter. Right. Here are the days of someone, as you mentioned, who knows ALM, IRR, liquidity, all those things kind of almost, almost more cut from the treasury world than the accounting world. Yeah. What are your takes on that? Oh, Brian, I've been seeing it and, and I kind of, I almost connected to the asset liability world in general. When I first started, I was told I could go to the ALCO meeting, do not, don't, don't speak, don't say anything. Only if someone asks you a question, I knew the numbers somewhere randomly that, that someone wanted to ask me. And I see that the same way, you know, the IQ of the chief financial officer hasn't changed. 
still incredibly mm -hmm. intelligent. It's different yeah. in terms of thinking about your balance sheet from a strategic perspective. I think 20 years ago, when we lived on four and four and a half percent margins. It was a lot more yeah. about tactics, right? Tactics, I've always said there's a big difference between strategy and tactics. Tactics are knowing what to do when it's right in front of you, right? Strategy is knowing what to do when it's not clear and concise, right? Nobody knew rates were going to drop when they did, but we had been preparing for it as long as the chief financial officer looks at their balance sheet from an agnostic perspective and says, I want to make sure changes in interest rates, yield curve shifts do not dramatically shift my earnings stream. That's a much different chief financial officer from a strategic perspective than was required 20 years ago, 15 years ago, even 10 years ago, quite frankly. Um, we've never been in an industry where, at a time in our industry, excuse me, where literally the Fed controls every part of the yield curve and the balance sheet is so massive that whatever they're going to do and however they do it, it's going to impact us so much more than it did 10, 15, 20 years ago. So I do believe yeah. you're spot on with the talent and the skill set. Um, that's why I loved uh, one of the pieces you put out there uh, a couple months back now, maybe a year ago, I can't remember. Um, but how sort of that seat has changed and people have come from different areas. Um, I think it's really important to talk about that. Yeah, you're, I think you're referencing that webinar with folks that actually came from your world. Yeah. The Jefferson yeah. Harrelsons, Jeff Jones, Colin Gilbert were on that. Yes. Um, That's right. And they've actually come from your world and have made quite a splash yeah. uh, at their respective banks. Um, one other kind of offshoot here that I just wanted to mention, maybe the last question is, you know, I talked to a bank um, down in the Southwest. It's actually a, a nice performing bank. Um, he's lucky the CEO is lucky because they're in a um, one of the fastest growing MSAs in the country. Not every bank can say that. Okay. There are geographies that are a little more barren where deposits and loans are not a plenty. And there are some small banks that are way, you know, they're, they're more reactive than proactive on some of these things. So what advice do you give for banks, you know, that are, you know, maybe not positioned as well as others right now? Yeah, no, I, I, and I think you, you, your point too is, Geography matters a lot right now, as clearly in terms of where 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 we're finding uh, loan growth, et cetera, deposit growth. But you know, look, I, I think that too many institutions, uh, you know, in certain asset ranges, those CEOs and CFOs, he or she, they're wearing so many hats, Brian. They can't even yeah. get to the forward thinking. They just want to make sure the examiners are okay with their with their outgo reports. And so it's it's not wrong to bring someone in to say, hey, let, let me let me kind of give you an opportunity to kind of bring us forward thinking, you know, and I kind of alluded to it a little bit. We can't treat Alco in this world like a dentist appointment, check the box. Everyone can't wait to get out of there until the next time. And in fact, we should, we should stream it all the way down to two or three slides in the room. Smartest people in our balance sheet in one room spend 45 minutes and, and really determine that if the yield curve either steepens or flattens 10 to 15 basis points on the parts of the curve that matter to us, these are the three things we're going to execute. Everybody agree? Agreed. That never happens. That never happens. And so it's we've almost got so much information that we have none. There's too much mm -hmm. coming in and there's just not enough uh, ability to summarize it quickly, effectively, uh, so that we can actually make a decision. Uh, because in my little nerdy world, what an opportunity we have to be a small institution with massive volatility. The small institutions in this country knock the ball, part, the ball out of the ballpark with triple P. Right. And so what an opportunity we have now. We've got more people on our balance sheet. How do we go out and use that and, and use our balance sheet as a weapon to deliver better products and services? Don't put interest rate risk on your customers. That's your own issue. Deliver yeah. what they want. And that's big. And it's hard uh, when you're wearing 45 hats for sure. Yeah. So those are some great points, Scott. I very much appreciate it, um, your time and your, your thought process. Uh, definitely an interesting moment in banking right now, and, and hopefully you're helping these teams uh, get more and more successful. So thank you so much for your time, Scott. Well, Brian, thank you. Thanks for having me. Thanks for all you do uh, in the community bank world. We appreciate it. I'm, I'm a fan of following what you're doing. So if I could ever be helpful, please reach out. And thanks again for having me.